Grace, mercy, and peace be unto you from God our Father and from our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Our text for this morning is recorded in Luke chapter 11, verse 17. A house divided against itself will fall. This is our text. And Lord, I pray that the words of my mouth and the meditation of all of our hearts may be acceptable in your sight. O Lord, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. Mr. President and gentlemen of the convention, if we could first know where we are and whither we are tending, we could then better judge what to do and how to do it. We are now far into the fifth year since a policy was initiated with the avowed object and confident promise of putting an end to slavery agitation. Under the operation of that policy, that agitation has not only not ceased, but has constantly augmented. In my opinion, it will not cease until a crisis shall have been reached and passed. A house divided against itself cannot stand. I believe this government cannot endure permanently half slave and half free. I do not expect the Union to be dissolved. I do not expect the House to fall. But I do expect it will cease to be divided. It will become all one thing or all the other. Those, of course, were the famous words of then Senate candidate Abraham Lincoln, delivered at the Republican State Convention in Springfield, Illinois. Those words would throw Lincoln into the national spotlight and set our country on a course to end slavery, but only after a bitter and costly civil war. Lincoln, of course, was quoting scripture in that speech, as he often did. He quoted the Matthew and Mark version of our text, a house divided against itself cannot stand. Now, Here in Luke, we cut to the chase. Not only Can a divided house not stand? It will fall. Many citizens in America today wonder how much longer the divided house of America can stand. Hmm. Abortion and the sanctity of human life, gay marriage and the very definition of marriage, religious freedom and freedom of conscience, the growing disparity between the haves and the have-nots as exemplified in the various Occupy movements. Each of these issues is causing major division, at least in the uh, political and public realm, but also even in the churchly realm, too. Abortion has been the law of the land since 1973 in the Roe v. Wade decision. Here in Wisconsin and elsewhere, there has been a push to define marriage as something more or something other than a lifelong union between one man and one woman. TV shows have already determined this is the direction we should go. The State Department has changed the language when talking about religious rights to a much more restrictive freedom of worship rather than freedom of religion. See the difference. The Occupy Wall Street and similar movements around the country have highlighted this growing disparity between the poor and the wealthy. We Lutherans have been historically rather quiet when speaking about national issues, and for good reason. We don't want social and political issues to replace our primary calling, which is to preach the gospel, to administer the sacraments. Nonetheless, things have gotten to such a pitch in our country that our synodical president recently spoke before our Congress on the fact that the conscience clause of the First Amendment is uh, being run roughshod by aspects of the new health care legislation. I'm afraid what we're seeing here today are the fissures that have long been simmering in this divided house and nation in which we live. Now, a few few days after the uh, Manhattan Declaration was released, I don't know if you're familiar with this document, but it was a document that spoke out for marriage and against abortion and some other social issues. And it was a document that I signed. Uh, It spoke, among other things, in favor, as I said, of traditional marriage against abortion. And when I signed this document publicly, 
I received some uh, hate email. <laughs> Isn't it great to know that we can get hate emails now besides the regular hate mail? Uh, at any rate, one email was from a gay couple in New York uh, who told me that I had ruined their Thanksgiving by the hateful words in this declaration where we declared that uh, marriage is the lifelong union between a man and a woman. These two men felt we had been hateful, we'd been hurtful, because we define marriage in this way. And this is, by the way, despite the fact that many thought this was one of the most reasoned statements on these subjects. But who would ever thought that this would be divisive to begin with in our nation? And yet it is. And I don't apologize for what I wrote, or what we wrote, but uh, it has caused division. And apparently the law, too, had done its work its work of uh, convicting. And it wasn't very pleasant for that couple. There was no repentance, but there was conviction. Conviction of their conscience, but also the conviction that they were right and I was wrong. We were wrong. A house divided against itself will fall. And we as a human race have been falling ever since Adam and Eve's conviction and fall in the garden for eating some forbidden fruit. And when convicted, what did they do? They went on the offensive, convinced that it wasn't really their fault. They blamed God. The woman you gave me, she gave me some fruit from the tree and I ate it. Well, at least they didn't say, if you were a loving God, you wouldn't have forbidden us from eating that fruit or made us in such a way that we would want that fruit. But nonetheless, they brought about the division between us and God's house that continues to this day. And we find that division even in ourselves, Paul says. The good that we want to do, we don't do. The evil that we don't want to do, that's what we end up doing. We need to get our house in order, not only as a nation, but as individuals. What can we do? A house divided against itself will fall. And in our case, we do need to fall fall on our knees in repentance, but also in faith, in the promise of the one who would deliver Adam and even all of us as he crushed the serpent's Satan's head, as we hear about even in today's lesson. And today is a day of national prayer, but perhaps it should be preceded by a day of national repentance. I have no illusions that's ever going to take place, although it did happen with Jonah and Nineveh. But we in this sanctuary know where repentance needs to start. It needs to start with you and with me. Repenting of those times when we've gone along with the world's way of doing things. Repentance for those times when we haven't spoken up. Repentance for when we have fallen short of the, the house rules we find in the law of Scripture. But then what? Then we look to the one whose house we have divided with our sin. And we look to his cross where his arms were stretched out in judgment for you and for me. But if you look again, you'll see that he was also stretching them out to bring us all together into him. To draw us and all humanity to himself that they may be one, as he said. God, who is faithful and just, will forgive us our sins our sins of indifference and neglect. And he will cleanse us from all unrighteousness. He will cast out the evil from among us and within us. He can take our divided house, our divided houses, and make them whole again. But what about our country? This is, after all, a day of national prayer. A house or nation divided against itself cannot stand. A divided house will fall. And the issue in the 19th century was slavery. Well, the issues in the 21st century are still dealing with residuals from that issue, but also issues such as the sanctity of human life, the definition of marriage, religious freedom, that growing disparity that I talked about before. If we can't agree about these issues, who knows what will happen? You know, our nation and we ourselves have often put our strength in our economy, in our military, in our own strength. But even as we put our strength in these things, we also remember what Jesus says here in our text from Luke. 
When a strong man fully armed guards his own house, his possessions are safe. And things seem fairly safe right now in our country. But notice what Jesus goes on to say. When someone stronger attacks and overpowers him, he takes away the armor in which the man trusted and divides up the spoils. Could that happen to us? Well, it could happen to anyone who is putting his or her trust in the wrong thing. If anyone thinks he stands, take heed lest he fall. So, my final question, what do we do? Well, we pray to our Lord, as Paul told us in his letter to Timothy. I'd like to close with these words. I urge then, first of all, that requests, prayers, intercession, and thanksgiving be made for everyone, for kings and all those in authority, that we may live peaceful and quiet lives in all godliness and holiness. This is good and pleases God our Savior, who wants all to be saved and come to a knowledge of the truth. May it be so, for Jesus' sake. Amen.